I'm Matt Lewis. This is the news. And our guest today is Shoshana Weissman. She manages the R Street Institute's digital media and writes for Weekly Standard National Review and has a really cool op-ed that came out recently in the Wall Street Journal. Shoshana Weissman, welcome to the news. Thanks so much for having me. Great to talk to you. And I want to ask about Twitter. I mean, you are huge on Twitter. You were great on Twitter. You do super fun and weird things on Twitter. You were getting paid to help stodgy, in some cases not stodgy, but to help conservative outlets and institutes be better in digital media. And I want to know uh, how you how you sort of honed your craft at Twitter. And were you ever afraid that 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 you would like maybe not get hired because you were I don't know having pictures of sloths or 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 Ben Sass holding a, a kitty cat like did it did it ever worry you that that um, that what ended up becoming a really cool and neat uh, and fun Twitter persona actually might not work out. Thank you, I appreciate that. It's um it's funny. I started out being pretty conservative, just very more activisty, like Yay Romney. I started on social media to help out Romney, basically, just because I was a giant nerd for him. So everything was pretty much, you know, within where um, I was working, just promoting Romney and stuff like that. And then it started getting into a little more constitutional law and then just silly stuff. And I, I tested it with the silly stuff, being like, let's see if people even like this. And mm -hmm. over time, people just complimented me, saying, you know, I love how you relate this policy to this meme, or um, or having congressmen and senators and and administration people now compliment me on the work. It, it, I kind I was always a little bit nervous about it, but it always seemed to go really well. But it definitely wasn't all at once. Um, I can remember the exact point I started swearing on Twitter, and that was around the time I joined the Weekly Standard. Um, after I had a job that was a little less delicate. Um, I had worked at America Rising Pack before that, managing their digital, so we had to be super careful. But at the Weekly Standard, when I could really develop my own voice and I started swearing, no one said anything. So I kept going there and then using well, more cloth. That's because Bill Crystal drops F-bombs left and right. Everybody <laughs> knows that. It's a hidden secret in Washington that Bill Crystal basically swears like a sailor. So I'm not surprised that it was perfectly <laughs> acceptable at the Weekly Standard. It's funny, he, he would make fun of me for swearing so much sometimes. <laughs> I also think part of it's because I'm so little and adorable that people think it's kind of funny when I swear. <laughs> but um, I don't know how it would go for people to swear as much as I do if I wasn't so little. <laughs> well, you know, it is, it's interesting because you have a, like a brand, a persona, and I think it really works. I mean, it's very authentic and it's not boring. And I do think conservatives have been criticized for being boring and stodgy and and uh you are not that and uh it, it it certainly worked what's the deal with the slots though so when i worked at america rising pack um i i was just online a lot more always looking for new ways to relate things to memes and gifts and to try to make it a little more engaging and the more you're on the internet in the parts where i was the more you see slots and at first i'm like these, these are kind of weird i'm not into them but then I just started looking at their eyes and they're so soulful and the way they look up at people like you can tell slobs really love people. And, you know, everything's so terrible in politics, especially now. How great is it just to have a really slow animal that does nothing more than love people? And they're so this is, pretty. Right? Well, this is why I like pugs, personally. Yeah, I, pugs here. are my pugs are my version of slots. But um, it strikes me that you're somewhat of a um, celebrity. And it's because of Twitter. I mean, you know, a few years ago, you would have probably been working. You might have been working in the conservative movement, but you might have been a behind more of a behind the scenes person, you know, maybe occasionally writing some stuff. But I mean, obviously, it's a it's a weird point to make that bef that like before social media, you couldn't have been a digital media. <laughs> you know, you couldn't have been managing digital media before social media. But put that out of your head. Uh, I guess my point is that like. Twitter has given birth to a um, uh, to a generation of you know of people who are, are somewhat Twitter celebrities um, that you know this this whole category didn't even exist a few years ago. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's funny because like I get recognized places and I just think it's funny because I'm like, who the hell am I? Like I'm just nerding and like being myself and apparently people like that. It's it's really funny, but I think I don't know where I would have ended up if there wasn't social media. I would like to say I'd have ended up kind of just doing comms, but so much of what I've learned about comms and what not to do is because of Twitter, like actually talking to people across the aisle, realizing that our, our mindsets aren't so different. I don't think that would have happened if there wasn't Twitter. There's so much I've learned here that even alternative work paths for me, I, I don't think they just would have happened um, with, without something like Twitter to teach me. It's it's really fundamental to what I do. I'm always testing new strategies on Twitter, trying to really manipulate the atmosphere in, in a way that benefits me and looking at the current atmosphere. But without it, it's funny. I, I mean, I might still be in activism doing more like on the ground stuff, but I, I think I would be a lot worse off in, in many ways without Twitter. So in terms of your Twitter, you know, the way that you view Twitter, because um, it certainly comes across as as that it's like just just fun and just intuitive. But I mean, are you like strategic about it? Do you like study? OK, at 10.03, uh, I need, you know, uh, heartbeat or whatever. I don't even know like what the like how many hits you're getting or like, um, you know, using TweetDeck and managing multiple accounts. And we're going to, you know, like how how much of it is seen as like just sort of fun and art versus how much of it is actually like you get paid. This is a job you get paid to like do this and to be a to be a professional at doing it. Definitely. Um, for, for like the majority of my professional accounts, it's, it's just professional, but I try to make it fun. But for my own account, it's, it's a mix of, um, a, a good chunk is just dumb stuff that comes across my mind. Like when I had a nightmare that my apartment filled with Clamato juice, um, I'm a vegetarian. So the idea that people mix clams and tomatoes into something is just really weird to me. So it's on my mind kind of a lot. But then there's the times when I'm just really passionate about something and I'll see it and I just want to tell everyone about it. And then I, I can understand how different people's Twitter behaviors are, different groups and sometimes just individuals. Um, so I kind of work into that. Like I know around what time of day people are going to be more receptive to certain messages. Um, back, back before when, when Twitter was a little bit slower and a little more predictable, I knew what what uh, policy issues, what kind of political issues would work at specific times of day, and I would plan them according to that. Um, and that made my life a lot easier, except now because it's so it's so not predictable and you have no idea what people are going to be talking about. It, um, it, it changed it for me a lot. So, I, so um, now I have to kind of think in the moment. Before, I used to be able to plan out a little more, which is kind of frustrating sometimes, but usually if I want something to, to get a lot of attention, um, I'd say like 90% of the time I know how to do it and how to plan out tweets for multiple accounts in a way that'll kind of make it happen, if that makes sense. So, and I, I want to get, I mean, I want to talk about urban, you know, new urbanism with you, and I want to talk about your 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 op-ed on Justice Willett in a minute, but I do want to, you know, stick here a little bit with the personality and the image thing. So you mentioned that, you know, that you're a vegetarian. You mentioned that you curse on Twitter um, and that you like sloths. I mentioned that. And uh, also you have um, dyed hair, right? Is it, it's like purple maybe no, now? It's natural. It, uh, rainbows just grow into my hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you have a good sense of humor. And the, <laughs> the point I'm making here is that, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about whether or not um, you were nervous about how it would be received in the conservative world. But I just want to circle back to that because, you know, a lot of things about you are fun and not and not traditional in the conservative sense. And I'm wondering, like, um, has this created any obstacles or has it been like embraced with open arms? You know, it, it's funny, too, because um I, you, 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 uh, you use the perfect word traditional. I don't believe in tradition because too often I believe it's, it's, uh, self-justified rather than justified by logic or, um, or thought. And that, that has always kind of frustrated me. So as, as a libertarian conservative, I'm kind of unique in that way. But, um, when I started in politics when I was 14, I had uh, a bit of blue in my hair. And I, I noticed people were looking at me funny in local politics. So in, in a year after that, I decided I would just dye my hair back to its natural color. 
Um, but um, when I joined America Rising Pack, I was working under Tim Miller, who later managed comms for Jeb Bush. And when I worked under him, I said, hey, you know, I would really love to have blue hair. It's okay if you say no, but can I dye some of it blue? And he let me. And from then on, it just kept growing, and I kept doing more of it. And um, when I interviewed at the Weekly Standard, a lot of my hair was purple, and they didn't say anything. And so I just asked, mm -hmm. like, is this okay? They didn't mind. So you you wouldn't think you wouldn't think of all places like the Weekly Standard wouldn't care, but Bill would always compliment me on my hair. Um, and it was it was just really funny, and no one said anything. And when I got hired, like at different places, people would just tell me how much they love my hair. So it ended up being a really good asset. Um, I'll, I'll get, very rarely will someone say they're they're not sure I should be doing it, but more often than not, I mean, again, like even senators and congressmen, they're like, you have great hair, like Paul Ryan mm -hmm. loves my hair. It's it's just, you wouldn't think, but a lot of them are really open-minded that way. Um, I don't think I could have done it 10 years ago, but for whatever reason, I'm really happy. Now everyone's really cool with the hair. Um, a lot of them enjoy the swearing too, even if they can't themselves. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's important to have like a brand too. I mean, I thought about the problem is, like, at my at my point in life, you you can't like r like retroactively decide to be eccentric or to have uh, like I, during the Romney era, I thought about wearing a monocle as like maybe my <laughs> my hook. Um, it would be very fitting, but but I I think that I mean I don't want to beat a dead horse here with the Twitter thing, but I think the fact that like you are are such a known commodity on Twitter and um and have that platform. Um, and have created a, a brand on Twitter for yourself that you get away with it in person. You know, it's it's just who you are. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, if you didn't have the Twitter platform, you show up at the Weekly Standard offices, they don't know who you are. And, it, you know, you might have had a different reception, uh, not receptionist, but they might have received you differently. That's a really good point. And I think that a lot of a lot of my success is owed to Twitter. It, it's funny, even the scholars I've met, the people who've influenced my thinking, I met so many of them on Twitter. And I know that a lot of people at the Weekly Standard, um, we were either Twitter friends or or they knew of me through Twitter. Um, and I, I mean, maybe if, if um, before Twitter and the interview, they realized that I was still pretty ideologically conservative, it would have been different. But it's it's certainly hard to say. Um, it, it's nice to see a lot more people doing the fun hair, like uh, Kato's digital person, um, Kat Murty is awesome, and she has really fun hair. But I'm not sure if she could have done that 10 years ago either, you know, because people would see the hair first rather than the thought. So I think that's a really good point. Maybe that's it. That's kind of why it, it's become a little more accepted. So I want to ask you about your brand of conservatism, which I think is pretty consistent with mine, although I was never a big Romney fan. And I know I know you were. But um, I think we both you know, we both like Ben Sass, and we both um, are into, you know, center right libertarianish conservatism in a way that could appeal to young people, to urbanites. Um, it, unfortunately, it seems to be very out of vogue with in, in the era of Donald Trump. You know, I think I wrote that book a couple of years ago and and, and the, the Republican Party promptly did exactly the opposite of what I thought <laughs> it to do and still won. But of course, it's called Too Dumb to Fail. So in a way, my title <laughs> ended up being proven. right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to get it to get your take on uh, on that. I mean, do I do I have I accurately described your brand of, of conservatism? No, absolutely. And and I think you're one of few who, who really sees eye to eye with me on the stuff. Um, I mean, I grew up like a Hannity conservative. When I was when I was a teenager, I thought Hannity was brilliant. I've I'm I've learned since then. But um but growing up over time and seeing what was working and what wasn't, it just seemed like I mean, I'm I'm very libertarian and very conservative, but I, I feel like too many people associate that with not caring and not not caring about cities especially. And that was that's just really dumb. Um, it, it's it doesn't make any sense to do that. And over time, I started seeing all the opportunities for conservatives in cities and with groups we just don't talk to a lot. And um and and your writing and your book always really resonated with me. Especially you had this one really great piece explaining why conservatives see um see the rural as um as as good and and urban as evil. And um and just immoral and and it's so true it, it's all based on false premises there there's some basis in religion a little bit for it um 
And, you know, I, I used to think that way, too, because that's what people that's what all the conservatives I looked up to told me to think. But the more you think about it, the less it makes sense to just ignore large groups of people. I mean, especially I know we both care about free markets. And if you care about free markets, those, those deal with people. The more people, the better, the more spe uh, specialization. Um, but I think so much conservatism th these days and especially under Trump and and a lot of other people are unfortunately just based on um just based on rhetoric rather than actual ideas, which has been really disappointing. But guys like Ben Sass and Governor Ducey, who I adore, they, they've just been so wonderful because they actually like know what they're talking about and have unique ideas. Um, it's disappointing. It's so rare. But um, but I, I've always appreciated your your outlook on it, because I think that we really see eye to eye on this stuff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had a, a bit of an awakening, too. I mean, I started I was a big Rush Limbaugh fan. Um, starting in 1988 when he went national. Tell me about your awakening or when when did you start to because some people some people might start off as Sean Hannity fans and then they become radicalized and, and become Bernie bros or something or, you know, they, they turn against conservatism. You, you turn to a more thoughtful brand of conservatism. But what was the awakening like? Um, and was it gradual? And, and uh, you know, what? why didn't you completely rebel against conservatism at that point? You know, um, I, I've always been an individual thinker, and I owe that to my father, who always made me question things. So if I said, you know, I think the government should do this, he would ask me why and have me explain it. And he would say, well, why are they best equipped to do that rather than someone else? And it's funny, now I'm the one asking him those questions when he uh, defers too much to government. <laughs> but um, but the way he raised me, it, I just, I'm not one to rebel against something because I don't like it. Like not, I'm very anti-majoritarian when it's like, but like I don't look at groups and judge them as a group. I look at individuals. And I mean, the, what Republican was a couple of years ago, I think well describes me. I'm not sure about what it is today though. But um, when when I was 19, I mean, I had spent years trying to learn about the Constitution, and none of it made sense to me until I met scholar Randy Barnett. Um, I'm a huge fan of his because he finally made it make sense. And kind of his view for the Constitution is now the way I see politics, just um, really making sure everything conservatives do are, is, are constitutional. Like, I don't think a federal law um, to outlaw abortion is constitutional because any way you look at it, it's a state issue. And it, it always kind of frustrates me when Republicans, uh, you know, ab abuse the Commerce Clause, especially about other clauses, when it's in their policy interests. And that just started making me look at things differently. Like, wait, both sides ignore the Constitution when it's in their best interest. And just kind of growing from there and seeing errors and trying to look at it honestly was what changed my mind on it. Um, and of course, with Trump, I mean, I just lost so so much respect for so many people. Um, and I realized that you just can't put faith in men, that it really has to be in the ideas and hopefully people who embody those ideas. But that was kind of when I started realizing things weren't what I thought they were. And and then, of course, getting involved with helping Republicans in cities just really opened my mind. Um, when Whereas I was a big Rush Limbaugh, like law and order conservative. Now I'm big on criminal justice reform because it's a conservative solution that actually solves problems and makes sense. So, so th those were kind of my three really big shifts. Yeah, I think once for me there were a couple of things. One of them you just alluded to is, is once you start um, trying to solve problems and actually have solutions, that will change some of your priors and your assumptions. I think whether you're on the left or the right. Um, the other thing is actually just really um learning so you know the more i started reading and seeing things for myself the more i realized that some of the things rush was saying i was just taking him at his word going well, rush knows more than i do i live in western maryland what do i know rush is talking to senators and he at the time i think he probably lived in new york city and uh and it turns out you start checking things out and and you know you were taking somebody else's word for things that wasn't necessarily the case so that that's sort of my, um, you know, I, I guess for me, the eye opening thing was I used to think that conservatives were all decent, good people. <laughs> I was so naive because I was like, why would you become a conservative if you didn't really believe it? Like you would just become a liberal Democrat. It's so much better. It's more fun. You can do whatever you want. 
nobody calls you a hypocrite. You don't have to, you know, have any values. You could just like if, I, you know, but but if you're going to choose to be a conservative, you must really believe it, because why would you choose to be like unpopular? That, that That's how it was, you know, for me, at least. Yeah, it's funny. I had the exact same thinking. Um, and I was so tribalistic as well years ago. You know, I, I would say I would think that all conservatives were wonderful people and all liberals were either mistaken or evil. And I just I, I, looking back, I can't believe I thought like that. It, it's so disappointing The the last two years, not any last bit of tribalism out of me, just because looking at how people justified bad things Trump does or, ju you know, just make excuses. It, it, it broke my heart. Like, I just couldn't understand why it was happening. But I think it, it, it's good because it knocked the tribalism out of me and and many other people. It's just it's it's a weird political atmosphere. Everything's kind of turned on its head. And now I, I love working at the R Street Institute in part because it's not partisan. And we 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 um work with Democrats and Republicans all the time. And it's just ideas based and like whoever is going to take up this idea will work with. It, it's so much nicer than just uh, hating the other side and talking to yourself. So I wanted to ask about this. You wrote uh, a few weeks ago a an op ed for the Wall Street Journal. And it ended up being, I guess, having a long tail or, or, or being relevant longer because you mentioned in it um, Al Franken, Senator Franken's uh, questioning of, of Justice Willett. And as we're taping this, you know, just like an hour ago, Al Franken announced his resignation from the Senate. So I just wanted to get your take on... Um, on that op-ed, why don't you just tell us a little bit about it and then the Al Franken part. For sure. So um, I, I sat in on Justice Willett's uh, confirmation hearing. We've been friendly for years. He's just, I think he's a wonderful jurist. And I love that he's on Twitter and he's a nice guy, but really his jurisprudence really hits my heart. I, I love the way he looks at it. Um, and, and I want to do everything I can to support someone like him. Um, I was really livid in the confirmation hearing, like at least with Gorsuch, people did ask about his jurisprudence. Nobody, n not one Senate Democrat actually talked about any opinions he'd written or any dissents he'd written. It was all tweets. They said uh, what what I just couldn't believe was uh, Senator Leahy um, was was grilling him over this tweet about bacon. Um, he had tweeted uh, after the Obergefell uh, oral arguments that he can't wait until he can marry bacon. And Leahy didn't see it as a joke. He said that that um, that showed that Justice Willett doesn't respect uh, gay people or pre or uh, judicial precedent. So he one he can't take a joke, and two there was no precedent. This was right after the oral arguments, not the decision. So so they're getting at these tweets, and and Leahy had once um, made these incredible this incredible line of questioning to Justice Thomas about the nuance of the Ninth Amendment. And I'm like, you went from that to this? Like, really? W what are you doing? Um, and then uh, Senator Franken and Leahy both uh, were grilling uh, Willett over a different tweet, mocking A-Rod. Um, and it used the story of a transgender girl. It, it's, um, I forget the text of the original tweet, but it was clearly just mocking A-Rod. And instead, um, Senator Franken wouldn't believe what Willett was saying. And he Willett was trying to put it in context because like A Rod had just gotten dropped from something and and it was like go away A Rod um and and Franken said you know um sometimes when you don't get the joke it's because it really wasn't a joke hmm. and um not you know the, Franken has the famous joke he made about um sexually assaulting someone and um then the next day it turned out he actually did sexually assault someone and it turns out there were many many more stories of that I I wasn't expecting that like I was just expecting to say you know, Senate Democrats don't even care about jurisprudence, but it's just a hypocrisy. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you're looking well, at the tweet. We've heard of karma, but that was like instant karma. Actually. Yeah. Like, like, he doesn't. Now, now I'm sure Al Franken wishes that other people had more of a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> but right? you know what? If they don't laugh, maybe it means his jokes weren't that funny. Right, exactly. Um, it, it was it was actually funny because um, I, I was asked to write the Wall Street Journal piece and during my, well, you know, I was writing it and then the Franken News came out while I was writing it and I'm like, I guess I'm adding this into it. <laughs> um, and Leahy, who was grilling Willett, had later tweeted, be more or less fat shaming uh, Donald Trump. Um, and I'm like, you're, you're kidding me. You're telling me that Justice Willett isn't qualified to be on the court because he joked about bacon. 
but you can fat shame on Twitter and like that's okay. The, the double standards, but especially with Franken, like I mean, I I was just floored. I wasn't. It, this was still. I mean, only a month ago. It feels like forever ago, but still kind of early on in all the scandals rolling out. And I just I didn't expect that he'd be resigning. Um, fun fact too. The um one of the last things Franken did as senator was a uh, vote against sending Willett to the floor. I, I was just livid. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, really? Like, you're still on this after all that came out about you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so before I let you go, I do want to ask you a little more about the Twitter feed. And I see now your your um, your handle, not handle, but like your your bio or whatever your name is, CFPB Director, Sloth Division, Shoshana Wiseman. Um, and your handle is Senator Shoshana. And it's really funny because people will tweet you thinking you're an actual U.S. senator. And you will respond saying, like, send $10,000 to my Capitol Hill office and I'll talk to you about this issue. <laughs> Has anyone ever gotten, like, really livid believing that you are a senator and, and having you try to shake them down? Oh, yeah, there's... um. So, so there's about, there's a handful of different responses I get. Every now and then I'll get the person who's like, oh, that was funny, my bad. And, you know, it's cool. Um, my favorite, though, is when people are like, uh, when I, when I reply and they'll, they'll basically say, oh, I was trolling you. It's like, no, you weren't. You didn't realize I'm not a senator, but they, they try really hard to play it off. Um, some people, uh, one person said that I should be living up to the prestige of being verified and that this is beneath being verified um, because apparently like they they know how behavior of people verified on Twitter ought to be um, but it's just the lack of humor with it it's like come on you messed up you thought I was a senator because you didn't do your research just laugh it off and they won't they get so mad um, sometimes they'll retweet me and then say um, look at this a senator's trying to get me to bribe them which I always enjoy um, it's just, it's too much fun not to have fun with. The only times I avoid it is if it's like about a really sensitive issue, like sex trafficking yeah. or something like that. But if it's about the tax bill, like you bet I'm going to have fun with it. <laughs> oh, I love it. And now uh, I assume because there was some question as to who the F, uh, excuse me, uh, as the CFPB director, uh, there was a, a question as to who the real director was. This is when you decided to to declare yourself the director. Is that right? Oh yeah, of course. Um, and actually, I'm the I have the most followers of any CFPB director, <laughs> so um, I think that actually makes me the legit one. So there's going to be more sloths in the CFPB. I hope Elizabeth Warren is okay with that. But that's just kind of where I'm taking things now. So do you think someday um, you might actually be a senator? It's possible. No, it sounds like the worst job ever. I love Ben Sass and uh, I love Senator Mike Lee and some others, but just like. I, their job sounds terrible. It sounds like they don't have a lot of fun. I get to work on all the policy I want and say whatever I want and help out all these different people. And do, and I love my job. It's the best I could imagine. Like, I don't know why anyone would ever want to be a senator. It just where, doesn't sound fun. <laughs> where are you from? Um, I'm from Long Island. Okay. Um, so I could never get elected there. <laughs> well, we could probably figure something out. We, we'll establish residence somewhere and, and you can make it happen. Um, this is fun. So I guess the last question, um, do you, are you going to at some point transition into, you think like full on policy wonkery, or would you always want to have a hand in, you know, social media and, and sort of tech digital media stuff? I think for, for the foreseeable future, I just want to stay in digital. I, I love it so much. I learn so much and I love instant gratification and on Twitter, I get my, um, and all other platforms I work on, I get basically instant, instant results. So I know if what I'm doing is working or if it's not. Um, and I really love being able to help out lots of different people, whether I'm working for them or not. Like even just promoting good stuff about Justice Willett, like that's important to me. And if I was just in policy, I would be able to do a lot less of that. Um, but I just love being able to get my hands into policies I care about every now and then. Um, just being able to write about licensing reform or the courts that it's just, I, I love that I'm able to do that and that people let me do it. Um, our street's really great with that too. They're always encouraging me to do more policy whenever I feel like it. Um, and it's, it's funny. I always 
in past jobs, I thought, you know, what, what else would I want to be doing? What other kind of work would I want to have my hands in? But here I just get to do everything I love. Awesome. That's so cool. And uh, if you're not already following her on Twitter, then what are you waiting for? It's at Senator Shoshana and Shoshana Weissman. Thank you for coming on the news. Thank you so much for having me. If you like this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at Matt K. Lewis. As always, the intro-outro music is performed by Matt's old band, The Backyard Apples. And stay tuned to another episode of Matt Lewis and the News. Music